Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It is Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019. Oh, can't believe it. We're in the last month of the year, literally one month away from a new decade, 2020, right around the corner. Hard to believe. Uh, but we got a lot to talk about today. I'll go ahead and show you the agenda that we've got going uh, for today. There are a number of things I want to go over. Of course, uh, we always start off recapping yesterday's action. Uh, we've got earnings spotlight. Not a whole lot in terms of earnings right now, so that'll be pretty brief. Upgrades, downgrades. I want to go through December seasonality. Uh, for those of you who don't follow me or haven't followed me much, I do uh, uh, follow the history of the market very closely. And I do pay attention to seasonality. I don't trade off of seasonality, but I do use it as a tool to help confirm other things I'm seeing in the market. So I've got some interesting December facts for you later in the show. And then we will wrap up today with three you must see. Always like to finish the show with three charts uh, that I'd like for you to take a look at. They're all, they all have to do with seasonality. So uh, pretty interesting charts uh, that I think you may want to look at. Um, I do want to remind everybody with 2020 right around the corner, January 4th, 2020. It is a Saturday, all day, Market Vision 2020. This is an event, an online financial event. I think it's going to be the best one of the year. Uh, John Murphy has agreed to come in as the keynote speaker. So you'll hear from John Murphy and then several of my colleagues here at uh, Stock Charts. Has, uh, they've all agreed to uh, join me. So we've got eight speakers. Uh, it's going to be a great event. Everyone giving you their opinion of what they see coming in 2020. I've always, uh, well, not always, but recently been very bullish. And uh, so it's good to hear from other technicians and get their views uh, to kind of maybe balance out uh, some of my wildly bullish predictions that I have from time to time. I do want to just show you, though, uh, how to register. If you go to earningsbeats.com and you click on the Market Vision 2020 tab at the top, you will see this, Market Vision 2020. You do want to sign up. This does not there's no credit card involved here. This is simply a free newsletter that talks about the event, but you're going to get your best deals there. We have uh, mini series events, which are educational events. Most of the speakers have agreed to do a brief mini series event, which will help identify, well, help you to understand a little bit more about their trading styles, their strategies, how they approach the market, the tools they use, all these different things. Uh, I did mine last uh, Friday, day after Thanksgiving. And uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal has already given hers, but we have a bunch more coming. The room instructions are given out to those who have subscribed. So it's free. All of these events are free until we get to the main event on January 4th. But you do want to sign up, name, email address uh, to get that information on the mini series. Also free giveaways on Friday last week. Uh, we're, well, we had a drawing for four quarterly memberships, free quarterly memberships at Earnings Beats. Uh, each one of those valued at $291. Um, Mary Ellen also had giveaways, and there'll be more giveaways from other speakers coming up. So uh, you do not want to miss this. And of course, uh, by signing up the newsletter, you'll be kept up to date of all the events as they happen leading up to the event. All right, let's move on to yesterday's action. It was the first really big down day we've had in a while. Um, if you look back at the Dow from the lows in early October, um, I, I didn't go back and look for sure, but I think yesterday's, or yesterday's decline of almost 1% was the biggest decline we've seen over the past, well, almost two months now. The S&P 500, same thing, NASDAQ, Russell, all of or the small caps, S&P 600 small cap, all really struggling here. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of the reasons why, I think, but if you look across the board, NASDAQ, the small cap, uh, S&P 600, both down more than 1%, the Dow and the S&P close to 1%. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just update this very quickly. Actually, let's take a look at this 10-year Treasury yield uh, just to get an update. It's down 6.5 basis points. Yesterday, we had a big pop to the upside, and I was a little surprised that it stayed up there because we did have a manufacturing report that came in weaker than expected. It was the ISM report. Um, and, of course, if you think back to when we had the uh, – a last big drop in the market. It was because of the ISM manufacturing coming in below expectations. We saw that yesterday. I think that partially explained the, the uh, drop in the market. And then of course, uh, to, uh, this morning's future is not looking very good either. And I think a lot of it has to do with that and also renewed uh, trade fears 
which I think are overblown personally. Um, but that is, uh, it's still part of the market, so we have to deal with it. Uh, looking at the sectors, I just pointed out five sectors yesterday, two that were doing very well, on a relative basis, doing very well. Staples actually did finish in positive territory. Energy was flat. And if you look at how the market did yesterday, that was actually very good on a relative basis. Real estate, industrials, technology, however, both taking hits, or all three taking hits, I should say. And uh, you can see the real estate, which was already under pressure, kind of rolled back over. Industrials moved to the lowest level it had seen, it's, it's seen in about a month, back down below the 20-day moving average for the first time during this rally. And then technology uh, did hold on to its 20-day moving average, but also rolled over. So not uh, very good action um, you know, when we look at the various sectors. I mean, industrials and technology, two of our key aggressive areas of the market. You can see both down substantially, 1.65% for industrials, 1.43% for technology. Um, in terms of the 10-year treasury yield, we looked at that just a second ago. Let's get a quick update again. Yeah, 1.77% down six and a half basis points. No economic reports out today, uh, but I do want to point out the ADP employment report will be out tomorrow morning. Non-farm payrolls comes out on Friday. So uh, not, uh, well, we'll see. The, the news is going to be big next couple of days. We'll see if that gets the market back on track or whether the selling accelerates. I did want to pull up on this chart. This is the 10-year treasury yield here at the top. Here's the S&P 500 in the middle. And then this is a correlation of the two. And I always talk about how these two tend to be positively correlated. I think when you look at this, you'll see that that pretty much is the case here, that uh, almost all the readings, the correlation readings are above zero, but we do get a little bit of negative correlation or inverse correlation from time to time. And we have it right now. And the reason is since November 11th, you can see the 10 year treasury yield dropped um, and the S&P 500 kept going higher. And we saw that also, if you look back in June and into July, when we had the steep uh, inverse correlation that, that dropped there, that also came with the 10-year Treasury yield moving lower while the S&P 500 went higher. And I mention this because if you look back at prior, the, the bear market, especially the secular bear markets, when we would get hit to the downside in the yield, meaning money was rotating uh, in more defensive fashion, when we would get hit in the 10-year treasury yield, we would also get hit hard in the S&P 500. And that's really not been the case here in uh, 2019. And I think that's a good sign. It's telling us that there's still enough money rotating in to actually help keep the S&P 500 moving higher, despite money also rotating into the more defensive treasuries. But I do think we're getting to a point where we'll probably see this turn as you look back Normally, these inverse correlations do not last very long before we get that reversal and turn back up and move into a more positive correlation um, situation. That's normally what you see with these two. So my, my guess is we're either going to have a bigger drop on the S&P 500 or a big push up in the 10-year Treasury yield. I actually think looking at the market that we might see the former, the S&P 500 continuing to drop. I don't think this is going to be a big huge sell-off, but I do think it'll be quick, volatile. That's the way the market usually works. We go up, it's painfully slow, boring action. Then when the market sells off, we get hit pretty hard to the downside. I think that's what we're going to see. Um, when we look at the market, I just want to show you why I'm saying that. I pointed out over the weekend to Earnings Beats members that the S&P 500 had a negative divergence in play on its daily chart. You can see the higher price and the lower PPO that is a negative divergence. And a lot of times what we'll see is a 50 period test and a PPO that moves back down to the center line. Now, this negative divergence was very slight. And sometimes if the market keeps moving up, you'll see that negative divergence be eliminated and simply go away. But now that we, have, we came down yesterday and failed to hold the breakout level, I think that 20 day moving average and the recent lows around 3,100, we wanna watch very closely. If we go down below those levels today, I think that that is uh, definitely increasing the odds of a 50 period test, which would be from where we are right now, probably about another 80 points or so to the downside on the S&P. So we're talking about maybe two to 3%. I don't think this, like I said, is going to be a huge decline, but I do think these negative divergences are worth paying attention to. And it's not just the S&P 500. 
I'm going to go ahead and shorten this chart just a little bit too to make it a little easier for you to see. But if we uh, take a look at the Dow, this is just a six month chart, but you see the higher prices here, the lower PPO, negative divergence. We fail to hold the breakout. Now we're on the 20, we're going to gap below it. I see a 50 day test coming up. I think 27,250 here is uh, certainly possible on the Dow in the near term. Let's move on to the NASDAQ. Take a look at this one. Here is the NASDAQ. Now, as we move to this high, I see a slight negative divergence on the PPO. And once again, failed to hold this breakout level. That is adding to the short-term bearishness. The uh, S&P 600 small cap index, higher prices, lower PPO. I think you're kind of getting an idea here. How about the XLK, the sector ETF for technology? Higher prices, lower PPO. Uh, XLF, another leader recently. Higher prices, lower uh, PPO. Semiconductors. Uh, semiconductors right here in mid-November at this high, the PPO had, roll in, had rolled over. Now, yesterday, we break below the 20. I think the, S, the uh, semiconductors could be in for a little bit more weakness here. And then finally, the banks. Uh, check out the banks just recently trying to break out here at the end of November. Actually did move to new closing highs, and with that, a lower PPO. So these negative divergences don't mean that we're at an all-time top. It doesn't mean that we're it can mean that, but I, the weekly PPOs are very strong. So I do not believe that is the case at all. But this could lead to more significant short-term selling. And we're seeing that, like I said, in the futures this morning. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention about yesterday's action is, uh, and I follow this pretty closely, the IWD versus the IWF. The IWD is the value ETF. So it's the uh, iShares Russell 1000 value ETF and the IWF is the growth. The value yesterday only went down a little over a half percent, whereas the growth ETF went down more than 1%. So there was definitely money rotating away from growth yesterday. And so I like to look at this IWF, IWD uh, ratio. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that on a solid line chart. And uh, go back, uh, let's go back a couple years here on this and take a look. Um, but you can see throughout the bull market, it's generally a good idea to have money rotating into the more aggressive growth stocks. Uh, last year, when we had the big Q4 decline, you can see growth stocks got crushed in that quarter, but then came rallying back, put in a new high. We saw over the summer, another big hit here, late August through the end of September, the IWF versus the IWD got hit pretty good, but we were starting to rally. And now yesterday, you can see we're starting to roll back over again. This will be interesting to watch to see if this continues. If it does, we could have some, uh, some issues going forward, at least, again, in the very near term. All right, uh, what else happened yesterday? Well, I mentioned the weak manufacturing data. Uh, Roku was downgraded. Roku, a uh, very, very volatile stock. And the thing is with Roku, there's so many variables with a stock like this. Um, they've got tremendous growth rates in place. But they're, and they're in a great area of the market, but now you've got competition coming in. So you've got a lot of different analysts with lots of different views on Roku. And if you just start changing the growth rate a little bit, it can impact the valuation of the company because it is based a lot on future growth. So yesterday, I think it was Morgan Stanley came out. They downgraded it to underweight, citing valuation concerns. They gave it a price target of 110. And you can see the stock down 15%, $24. The, get used to it. If you own Roku, this is the, the real world with Roku. It's very, very volatile. You might have another analyst come out next week and say, you know, it's a $200 stock or a $250 stock. And you might see the stock up $15, $20. It's just the world that the stock is going to live in when you get a really high growth, rapid growth stock like uh, Roku. And then you start mixing in co uh, competitive concerns valuations, um, interest rates, you know, depending on what interest rates do, that can affect the present value of those future cash flows. There's lots of different things that come into play. I think Roku continues to perform um, excellent uh, fundamentally. I think technically they're volatile, but the stock to me continues to look very strong despite yesterday's downgrade and the big hit to the downside. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, ViewRay, this is a small company. But I wanted to mention it stocks up 29% in pre-market, or at least it was last time I looked. 
you can see the stock started to show some strength, a little bit of volume coming in after being in the downtrend. Well, they announced today that they are um, they were going to issue $75 million worth of their common stock. Normally, that's a bad thing, um, dilution. But they also announced collaborations um, with uh, EKTAY and Medtronic MDT, which includes both investments and clinical collaborations. So I think that was pretty big news for the company. Again, stock up 29% in pre-market. Uh, United Health pre-announced their fiscal year 19 earnings per share, which uh, they're saying is going to be maybe just slightly higher. Fiscal year 20 earnings per share, they say, is going to be in line with estimates, revenues in line. You can see United Health has been performing very well. And on a relative basis here, you can see also it is moving back up, challenging three to four month relative highs versus their peers. Um, the stock, by the way, is down 2% pre-market action. Uh, CNI, this is a railroad, Canadian National Rail. They uh, lowered their fiscal year 19 earnings per share due to, a, to the impacts of a strike. And the stock was down about 1.5% in pre-market. But 1.5% does take it below the 50-day and takes it below this recent low. So we could see, I, 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 it, to me, it depends what happens after the open today. A uh, stock like this that's now gapping back down, looks like it's rolling over. I really want to see a hollow candle here. If you don't see that, I think this is one that potentially could go back down to about that 84. This stock has been downtrending relative to its railroad peers for three months. So, you know, while uh, maybe the news is catching some by surprise, it looks to me like maybe there were some exiting on a relative basis before the announcement. Last announcement, uh, Cliff, I think it's Cliff, uh, CLF, yeah, Cleveland Cliffs. Uh, they announced an uh, all-stock deal, $1.1 billion to acquire AK Steel, which is AKS. Um, as you might Im imagine, in an all-stock deal, the acquirer usually gets hit due to dilution. CLF down about 9.5% today in pre-market action on the announcement. AKS, AK Steel holding, is up 8.65% on the announcement. So uh, should be a pretty good day for AKS, not so much for CLF. All right, let's move on into earnings. Got a bunch to try to squeeze in here next 15 minutes. Uh, but let's go ahead and I only have a couple of stocks for earnings. COUP, which is Coupa Software. This was an interesting report. Stock uh, beat top line easily, beat bottom line, guided quarter four revenues and earnings per share higher. And the stock is down 5% in pre-market. Um, I think it's still just consolidating. I think that's a good report that they come out with. I wouldn't be surprised. If it does continue to move lower and moves back into the 130s, I think you're going to find some support down there. I believe the stock eventually breaks out. That was a nice report, but the market doesn't always react the way we think it should. The other uh, company I wanted to mention is DCI, which is Donaldson Company. This one was a little bit of a surprise. Um, their relative strength had been picking up until the last six weeks or so, started to roll back over. This was not a good report. They beat, or excuse me, they missed on their top line. 672 million versus 699. Bottom line, 51 cents versus 53. Stock down about 4% in pre market action. Um, you know, it had a nice little uptrend, little cup, it's pulling back, um, but it doesn't look like that cup is going to play out. And instead, we'll want to see whether or not we can hold the uh, 50 day moving average on DCI. All right, upgrades and downgrades. Uh, just a couple here to mention as well. I want to start with APTV. This is Aptiv. They were upgraded today. I actually like the upgrade. I think this is a solid looking chart. Love the volume trends here as it's made this breakout, holding this area of support, which I would continue to watch around 88, 88 and a half. I think that's key support to the upside. We want to get that breakout above 97 and a half, but I see a stock that is actually one of the leaders in the auto parts area. So APT, uh, APTV upgrade. Seems like a pretty good one to me. Downgraded was Netflix today. Now, Netflix went up and broke out above this 310 level. So on the surface, that looks pretty good. But when it did make the breakout, I'm telling you, there wasn't a whole lot of volume supporting this break to the upside. Um, so I was kind of on the fence. You can see internet stocks up there making the breakout above the prior highs. But Netflix on a relative basis really has been in this downtrend for a while. 
So I'm not shocked by a, by a, a downgrade and uh, anything back below a close back below that 20 day moving average, I think would be bearish for Netflix here. So I'd be a little careful. Uh, a couple of stocks initiated. Uh, you may have heard of these Google uh, initiated. How can a company like Google just be initiated? I'm not quite sure. But Google being initiated at Piper Jaffray to an overweight Amazon um, uh, initiated at Citigroup with a buy. Beyond Meat uh, initiated at Oppenheimer with a perform and Enphase, ENPH. This is a really volatile stock as well, uh, kind of like Roku. Uh, but uh, ENPH was initiated by uh, Goldman with a buy. So uh, that's one starting to look a lot better after being in this downtrend. The longer term chart on ENPH looks much better than that short term downtrend. I mean, I think if you see this, you see it's gone through periods like this where it's been underperforming for a while. And then uh, we're waiting to see if we get that breakout. But the upgrade here certainly won't hurt ENPH. All right, uh, how about we move on and uh, why don't we go into the December seasonality? I always like seasonality because it just it's another tool I do believe that history repeats itself. I think there are reasons why certain stocks, certain uh, areas of the market do well during periods of, of the year. And so I just like to keep track of um, seasonality. So I'm gonna start um, and I'm gonna just pull up the S&P 500. But uh, to give you some numbers, the S&P 500 during the month of December since 1950 has an annualized average return of 17.52%. Now keep in mind the S&P only goes up 9% a year since 1950. So December is almost twice twice as strong as the, um, the uh, annual return. So the S&P 500 loves De December. It is uh, the S&P's second best month. The first uh, month is November. So November tends to be the best month of the year for the S&P. You can see we had a pretty good November this year. Um, December, despite the huge drop last year, and really the last handful of years, December has not been a great month. But if you go back long term, uh, it certainly makes up for it with uh, how it used to trade in December. So I would still keep that in mind. I think December uh, typically is a good month. Um, it's just recency bias, maybe that uh, makes us think it's going to be bearish. All right, uh, the NASDAQ. We pull up the NASDAQ, just looking at this chart, we got a breakout here. Um, the NASDAQ, December annualized return, 19.01%, uh, third best month, literally just a tad below November, which was is the second best month. And January is the best month for NASDAQ. So we still got that looking ahead. The Russell 2000, uh, annualized return on the Russell 2000 since 1987. By the way, the NASDAQ's return I gave you was since 1971. The Russell 2000 since 1987, annualized return during the month of December um, is 28.21%. I'll go ahead and just pull that up on the uh, S&P 600 small cap, it's another small cap index. But you can see we just recently broke out above 1000. We're pulling back. I think this is gonna be a short term pullback. I really do. I think small caps are going to turn back around and potentially lead the market to the upside. We shall see. Uh, but 28.21, that's a very strong annualized return for the month of December over 32 years. And that is the best month of the year for small caps. As far as sectors go, and I'm gonna pull this up showing you the seasonality uh, tool here. So if you go up over here next to the, the uh, sharp chart and just hit that drop down menu, click on seasonality, and then let's pull up uh, the XLV, which is healthcare. Now, if I just drag this back, it will show me that in November, uh, the XLV has gone up 75% in November's and it's averaged 2%. December, 65% of the time it's gone higher and it averages moving up 1%. Now, again, this is just over the last 20 years. Um, if I put in the S&P 500 and show you relative to the S&P 500, you will see that uh, November, December, January, and February, the XLV has averaged outperforming the S&P 500. So we're hitting a pretty sweet spot right now with the XLV. And I just wanted to mention that because when you look at the XLV on a chart, um, it broke out in November just as it's hitting into this bullish period. So it's starting to do what it typically does uh, from a seasonal perspective. So I think healthcare is a group that we wanna continue 
really to focus on here. Um, as far as industry group, groups go, I'll tell you that the tires, this is a, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this one up because this is very interesting. When I, when I looked at it, it uh, just really stands out. November and December for the tires, look at this. No, and look at the average returns, November, December. This is 20 years going back. Clearly, November and December, something's going on with tires. Um, average returns, 9.1% a year over the last 20 years in these two months. So uh, definitely the tires is one uh, to keep an eye on. Um, and you can see tires actually breaking this down trends, looking a little bit better uh, from a technical perspective. So maybe we do continue there. The only other one I wanted to mention real quick is just semiconductors um, only, have only gone up 40% of the time in December over the last 20 years. That's like eight of the last 20 years. We do have this negative divergence. I don't know, maybe we go down and we just sideways consolidate here, but I would not be surprised to see a 50 day test coming up on these semiconductors. All right, uh, we are now going to move into the three you must see to end the show. And I'm gonna go back to the seasonality chart. And I went through the Dow stocks and I just thought these were kind of interesting. So let's pull up Apple. Uh, from a seasonal perspective. You can see the last five years, very, very weak in December, averaging going down 4%. But look at the last 20 years. September and December are the only two months of the year that have negative returns for Apple. Going, I mean, obviously the last 20 years have been very strong for Apple. Um, December only goes up 45% of the time, which also ties for the low among months, and minus 1.9%. Um, average return. So I think the seasonality chart is definitely one uh, to keep in mind with Apple. We've had a huge run on Apple, but this is a month that the stock tends to struggle in. So keep that in mind. Next up, Nike. Now, Nike, if we go back 20 years, I just thought it was interesting look at, looking at September, October, November, and December. I mean, you've got the back to school thing with September. I kind of get that. But when you look at these four months and, and add this across, that is 12.6%. Uh, That's the average return for Nike the last 20 years, just from September through December. Um, that's a lot, 12.4% in four months. And I think uh, when you look across here, I believe it's like 6% from January through August, maybe a little more than 6%. Let me see, 293942476, uh, actually 5.4, 5.4%. Uh, so, the last four months of the year have produced more than double the first eight months of the year. Anyway, I thought that was interesting and worth mentioning. So that's the second seasonality uh, chart you must see. And then the last one I have is uh, United Health. Mentioned United Health earlier um, and the fact that they had pre-announced their results going forward. But look at the last three quarter or the last three months of the year. This is by far the strongest um, quarter of the year for UNH. It averages going up 10.7% uh, just in the fourth quarter for the, over the last 20 years. And uh, so, and I mentioned earlier, healthcare tends to really like this time of the year as well. So you've got a strong healthcare sector. UNH is one of those stocks within the group that really does well uh, this time of the year. And when we look at that chart, I'll just show you this last thing before we wrap up. You can see fourth quarter, all of a sudden UNH catches fire. All right, that is it for today. Again, just a quick reminder that uh, I am going to have that Market Vision 2020 coming up. Uh, go to earningsbeats.com, click on the Market Vision 2020 tab, and make sure you register. It is free to register for the newsletter. All right, uh, I want to wish everybody a great day today. Thanks so much for joining me here on Trading, Trading Places Live. I'm here on Stock Charts TV every Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 9.30 a.m. Everybody have a great day. Happy trading. See you on Thursday. Thank you.